the only one here. Hey, hi everyone. Hi. How's it going? Good. Let's wait for a couple of minutes for folks to join. Hey, thanks for joining everyone. Hey, Rajas. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you good. doing? Hey, Ricardo. How's it going? Good, good. So uh, today we have uh, Case GPT. Alex from AWS will be talking about that, but he mentioned that he'll be in a little bit later, maybe another 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So, yeah, it's pretty wide open. I think uh, maybe one of the things that we can talk about is the cloud native AI white paper that um, the community is creating. And maybe if anybody has any feedback or anything they would like to add, or uh, we'd love to get some contributions. <laughs> I, I think I can share that uh, document. Just give me a second. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Ricardo. Yeah. Um, one of the things is like I've, um, I'm still going through the document and digesting it, and seeing how you can relate both cloud native and AI ecosystems together, and also yeah. anyone. All of these discussions are happening on working group artificial intelligence on CNCF Slack. So if you want to get involved over there, that's the Slack channel you should join. Yeah. The uh, working group um, artificial intelligence channel, right? Post a link to that channel too. Okay, that's, yeah, that's the direct link. They're just looking for general feedback on this white paper. 
Yes, yes. So So the yeah, so the goal I guess in, in at a high level is I mean two things. One of one of them is how cloud cloud native can help um AI, run AI type of workloads to scale them, to make it more available, more resilient. Um, a lot of, of it is related to Kubernetes right? and, and how you scale, how you make Kubernetes uh, or AI type of workloads run on top of Kubernetes. And then the other aspect that has arised, I think it related to generative AI is how that's helpful for cloud native. Uh, for example, how you can use generative AI to create an architecture or cloud native architecture or to see the gaps in, that you have in your system or how to monitor your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this is something related to the Kate's GPT project. So those are the two kind of high level goals, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot more information in the paper so far. Uh, but yeah, any, any any feedback or anything that um, anybody from the community has is actually welcome. Any comments from anybody on the call? See Sean and Valentin join too. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, do we have uh, access to the file over here? Yeah, yeah. I just posted, we we posted it on the meeting chat. I don't know if you cannot see it. But you might have joined. No, it maybe it's okay. It doesn't show the history. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. I think Rajas, uh, Sean reposted it. Yeah. So uh, Sean and Valentin, uh, you join a little bit later. So we're waiting for Alex to join. He's going to be talking about the Kate's GPT project, but he's running a little bit late. So in the meantime, we're talking about this AI, cloud native AI. Uh, white paper that the community is creating. Great, thanks. So this is a brand new white paper from the CNCF, right? Is yeah, that so that's the, the plan what is we to have... publish it. Yeah. Got it, okay. So, so the plan is to publish it uh, through the CNCF. It's not ready yet, as you can see, that there's a lot of areas that we're working through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same like the supply chain and the security white papers, which we released. similar, yeah, similar to that, yeah, Got no, it. analogous okay. to that. Awesome. Sean, uh, maybe I can get a little bit of uh, your perspective on in terms of special purpose operating systems. Uh, is there any um, angle from? Uh, AI and special purpose operating systems that you can think of? I was trying to pick your brain. Yeah, um, not specifically. I know many of us work with uh, with GPUs and um, can utilize those like you normally would in, in a Kubernetes cluster, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I have to think about it. I, I, nothing really jumps to mind as being a kind of a unique thing with special purpose operating systems in that type of environment. So using the GPU drivers to boot up uh, when, or when an operating system boots up or something? Yeah, um, specifically in the case of Bottle Rocket, um, there, there's a NVIDIA variant for um, many of the versions that are supported and, and that just is it includes the um, 
GPU drivers and some of the NVIDIA tooling for being able to use them. Got it. And that that can also be uh, used by the containers that uh, I'm probably running inside the yeah yeah model rocket. Yeah. Yep. So they can be passed through or, or shared, split up between containers. Um, yeah. But that part is is pretty mostly standard. Um, so from the Kubernetes perspective, I, I don't know if there's anything really unique about um, having the worker nodes being a special purpose operating system. And, and then from the other angle, which is um, using generative AI to uh, to maybe do an inventory of your operating systems, is that something you think that would be useful or not? Or I, I saw an announcement from AWS last week at the AW, uh, Amazon Q that talks about your environments or basically your whole AWS account. Right? I'm just wondering if there's anything from that angle. I'm not sure. I, I didn't see that announcement. I'm not really. Um, I'm not yeah. Really... So, so there was a AWS reinvent last week and then they, it's, it's kind of like your assistant like on your AWS account. Okay. And it's using generative AI. So there were a lot of AI announcements and that yeah. I think <laughs> I think about like maybe seventy percent of the announcements were about AI. Yeah. Uh yeah, kind of again, I can't think of a, a anything specific with special purpose operating systems, but yeah. I'll think about that. That's good good to Keep in mind, at least, I, I haven't really looked at some of those announcements yet, so I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, th I, think, I think one more area uh, which also came up during KubeCon and kind of tangential to operating systems is also setting the infrastructure layer for running AI workloads, especially on Kubernetes, and like trying to see how we can uh, uh, optimize the GPU resource utilization and things like that during training time, things like dynamic resource allocation and stuff like that. So I think there's uh, some progress happening in the batch working group in the Kubernetes ecosystem as well uh, on dynamic res resource allocation and maybe uh, that's also another area to look at. Yeah, that reminds me, there was um, uh, a lot of the machine learning um, type of environments in the past have used Slurm to manage their workloads instead of um, Kubernetes. And CoreWeave actually announced, uh, had a presentation at KubeCon, and it's not open source yet, um, but they have a... I, I think it's a Kubernetes scheduler that integrates some of the Slurm um, way of doing things. Um, so if someone is has existing workloads where they're, they've been using Slurm, um, it should help them migrate to a Kubernetes environment. So um, I haven't read through this white paper yet, but if that, that could be something else interesting to mention. What do you know, just out of curiosity, what the what that scheduler does differently? Is that more around like GPU stuff or yeah, and it's also I think the um I, I should find the video. Um sure. Uh, from what I understand with a, a Slurm orchestrated workload, it really tries to maximize resource usage and and it kind of, t I think it's it's kind of ties in with the batch processing, um, like Rajas had mentioned. Um, that's what reminded me of it. Um, where where how those workloads are are spread out, or or how they're how you try to use utilize the resources on a Kubernetes node uh, might be different if you're running just a like a general purpose, um, you know. What what might be considered a typical Kubernetes workload versus something that's really focused on machine learning and and optimizing your use of GPUs. 
Gotcha. Cool. Okay. I think this is going to be awesome. Uh, I was talking with the Linux Foundation that was right across us in KubeCon in Chicago, and uh, they said like the third more, the third pie of the most requested courses and trainings are based on AI. So they think that uh, is start trending and it's not going to go away. So simple. So uh, going with the AI cloud native white paper is something which is very cool. I'm super eager to see what is going to happen next couple of months. Yeah, it's moving pretty fast. So we're trying to catch the wave too. The mm -hmm. another interesting area about I think performance is that a lot of um folks in the ecosystem are running API calls to services like OpenAI or Google Bard or some of these um, AI services, but that may actually introduce a, a cost element. I've, I've seen that the OpenAI API is actually pretty expensive. So uh, some folks in the ecosystem might just want to run their own models or mini LLMs or something that you know, they host internally and they might want to just scale up and down depending on their needs, right? So the, the, the need for scaling or having an elasticity, uh, yeah, cost can be can be an issue with, with some of these API providers. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, Alex is also here, but just to wrap up on this point, uh, another area that maybe we can look at is uh, integration with things like Wasm runtimes and maybe embedding uh, LLM models or things like that in, in terms of Wasm binaries so that we can carry out inference. I think this is part of the inference uh, section uh, of the white paper, but I'm not sure, but just wanted to mention that. Okay. Which part of the white paper? Is? Uh, the training and inference on crowd, but I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I don't think there's a, yeah, we can add that section. It, somebody actually commented on that too uh, yesterday when we were actually discussing this. I yeah, follow. That, yeah. Uh, well, thanks everyone for, for uh, going through this, but uh, yeah, Alex is here, so we'll, we'll let him take it away. Hey folks, apologies for uh, keeping you waiting. Uh, a bit of an eventful afternoon. Let me uh, share my screen. So I want to spend some time talking to you about Kate's GPT uh, as a project. I hope you can see what is, yeah, I see my slides, great. So um, Kate's GPT today has come about because of the mainstreaming and popularization, as you know, of inference APIs and availability of general AI models. And, um, you know, it was something that from my mind um, was actually just an accelerator for an existing project that I had rather than being something off the basis of um, open AI or any sort of marketplace wrapper. Um, I worked in, as an SRE for some time and let an SRE team do sort of hardware and, and, and software infrastructure. And um, one of the things I always found really challenging was codifying knowledge and being able to pass it on to other people. And uh, one of the, of the things that, you know, AI is really good at is actually helping you to um, distill, take natural language and actually simplify that, right? So when I was thinking about what capabilities we could connect together with this sort of, as I said, codification of, of, of SRE knowledge with AI, it became very obvious that um, pattern recognition uh, was a really easy one to see direct benefit from because you know you can perform a regression on on a on a, a basis of text a window of text with context and you can actually um start to, to train models and there have been models trained uh you know we've seen the outcome of, of, of many many very highly performed models that can now pass text and they can give you some meaning out of it so when i thought about 
why this was interesting. I thought, well, that, that really aligns directly to the problems I'm having because although I'd written all these um, analyzers for, for in Golang for sort of SRE problems, uh, it was still quite complicated to understand what they actually meant, right? And and so really connecting the dots to the movement of AI is really what led me to um, think about how could I combine these two different interfaces together? So, you know, this was really the dawn for me sort of early last year was, okay, how can I connect this together? How can I start to think about providing value? And the value that we're creating is twofold, right? One is that you're um, you're crystallizing knowledge in the sense that you are producing reproducible SRE knowledge by codifying that. And I'll go into that later on. But you're also starting to lower the bar so that you don't need to be a sysadmin of 20 years experience to understand that there's a soft IRQ reset that's surfacing in the log of a demon set pod, right? It can You can actually... Um, take that known quantity and you can print it out in a simpler fashion for somebody to say there's a there's a problem at the kind of linux kernel level you need to you to sort of look into that so the, the the real hard part about this is that you know as i said a lot of the knowledge is tribal a lot of the uh, knowledge is tacit and um troubleshooting in kubernetes is, is intrinsically hard because it's the pejoratively linux really you know the errors you're getting uh that are, that are complex uh, and you get some stuff from pods and and you know from kate's api itself but that's relatively simplistic to understand if you're a, if you've worked with kate for a little while the real challenge is when you go deeper and have more complexity for example you run a system on top of kate such as GitOps, like argo or something and then you've got another layer of complexity so you know it was about how do you start to uh, break this down so the KHGBT project, in effect, looks at um, oscillating or at least modulating the signal to noise ratio by taking a lot of these event sources um, and actually using AI to simplify and provide clarity. So it's been described by some people as a, an observability tool. It's been described by other people as sort of a synthetic uh, DevOps tool. And it's been described uh, by others as sort of an AI ML uh, operator in case so there's a lot of different ways of viewing it um and you know for the context of this group it, it's it's it is a runtime application that has uh, tangible outcomes on on how you can operate your cluster so let's let's have a look at actually what case gpt is i have a little sequence in this gif that sort of gives you the really quick uh, intro into the thinking of how it, it sort of looks at the world right so it's first and foremost aligned around the Kate's uh, client Go library, right? So that's really where it draws its its um, its input. So we we have a bunch of analyzers, and I'll, as I said, I'll come into the specifics of those in the next couple of slides. But those analyzers allow you to um, look at different uh, facets of a resource, right? Like cron jobs that are hanging, cron jobs that have overrun, cron jobs that have never started, pods that are in backup mode. And the lovely thing about this is it's all unit testable because these are um, specific states that we're looking for, you know. And the great part, as you saw in the green text, perhaps just, just briefly scrolling through um, in the output of that is that the AI comes back and it, it doesn't it doesn't hallucinate uh, per se because effectively it's just take you just tell the AI to take this error message and make it more readable. Uh, in many cases, I'm not saying it's hallucination free. I would never claim that. There, I'm sure there are things that that are that are wrong, but that's the beauty of this: is that we're not hooked to one uh, backend. You can bring your own model. Like I don't care. It, it, it's um, it's a it's a multi-model compatible, multi-API compatible system. To give you kind of a context of that, um, some of my colleagues have just contributed SageMaker integration uh, two weeks ago. And then prior to that, we had Bedrock integration and we've got Cohere, we've got OpenAI integration. We also even have one called Local AI, which is kind of interesting because you could, in your own cluster, host your own model. You could grab it off the Hugging Face Marketplace. You use this C++ wrapper called Local AI and it gives you an inference API to serve. So it's not too far away from us then being able to actually uh, do training and inference in the side two clusters or even the same cluster if you're feeling uh, if you're feeling rich. KHGPT, um, when I built it, as I said, OpenAI was the first thing I started working with, but right off the bat, I never wanted it to be open API specific. So, you know, this this uh, really took off in, in about April when I when I was when I was playing around with it and we've had a great trajectory so far we're sort of like 3600 stars you know vanity metric but it gives you kind of a feeling for the the buzz and i think our community is is about 
I would say it's about 400 people, but it's really probably about 60 active people who really do con- do a lot of contributions. And out of that, our core contributors are, um, are probably about 20 or 30. There's a couple of people here who who really do um, push the needle. And as I say, we've had some some folks from uh, at AWS who have started contributing too, which is quite cool to see. So let's just get into sort of the secret source of the um, the analyzers. You know, really, it's it's quite simple stuff. You know, it's it's sort of um, you're introducing a state machine in a way, and you're you're actually um, appending these failures, and then we run the failures through the AI to pass them to make them more contextual. Um, I, I intentionally wanted to include this not very sexy looking piece of GoLang just to show like there are things that we do um, to provide inter resource context, right? So, for example, a pod, we then fetch the event for that pod. We then combine the event and the pod to create a con- what we call like a context window, um, which allows you to provide additional data when you're providing that to the LLM. To give you a kind of a view on that, you know, this is a singular analyzer, analyzer here. You can selectively turn them on and off. You can extend them and write your own. Um, when you actually contact the API server, it will do uh, effectively an in, in runtime passing of, of the results. Um, and then it then builds those out and enriches those results. And you can then do what you want with them. KHGPT itself has Slack integration. It's got Prometheus metrics integration. People are using the service monitor in Prometheus to, to then trigger uh, alert manager outputs. And so the custom resources that the, um, that the operator produces are actually now being used uh, in some companies as a um, in dashboards to detect. If you have any of those resources, it means you've got uh, issues a bit like with Trivi. You think about Trivi, you know, you've got your Trivi resources, vulnerability scan reports. That usually means it's aligned to a, a CVE. Uh, KHGPT, by the way, has an integration with Trivi, as you might have seen in in the um, the GIF, where it can detect and scan and prioritize CVEs, which is quite cool. This is a little diagram of the operator, just to give you some context. The operator actually has a um, KHGPT resource. It will uh, use that to de- decide where to deploy the, the, the deployment. This is, a, as you know, kind of a typical pattern where the operator is disconnected from the deployment. So you can then do in-place upgrades. Um, it also allows us to have one-to-many. And as we're starting to see, people are interested in doing multi-cluster. And we've actually started piloting having KHGP deployments being able to be in different clusters with a singular uh, operator and using a specific labeling system to control that. So let's go to a, um, a demo. I will just uh, reshare my screen to uh, to cover the CLI as well. Um, so here's a uh, here's, here's a, a view in sort of what I've got. I've got a really simple um, kind cluster, and you can see I've got a um, a, a broken pod uh, with an, with a you know an image that doesn't. Um, a command that doesn't exist in this image. So the pod, the pod pulls, the image pulls, but the pod doesn't work. So the simplest command you can do is uh, KHGPT analyze. This doesn't use any AI, right? This is just using Golang and detecting problems. And that's great, right? Because you shouldn't have to use AI to make a product valuable. AI should be supplementary to improve its value. So if we use the AI, uh, you go dash E, um, and then this is where it will actually go off and, and package this up with the context it has uh, and then come back again, right? And, and this, is no, this is no smoke and mirrors. It's effectively just giving you additional uh, data points around this. This varies as well. And we also have different analyzers that do slightly different things. So for example, um, we have a, a fairly new analyzer that came out. In fact, I'm, I'm on a, I'll, I'll just run it off my local. Um, <laughs> didn't expect to do this. Um, we have a fairly new analyzer that came out just after KubeCon, which um, gives you log analysis. And that's quite exciting. Uh, as you can see, I've got it turned off, but I could, I could probably turn it on. Sorry, uh, it's, is... it, it's just showing the demo slide. Are, are you? Oh, oh wow, I've been talking all this time and no one said anything. <laughs> oh, thank I you for saying that. I can see your screen. I can see your yeah. screen. I, I can see so. your console. Oh, I guess it's just me. <laughs> Oh, weird. Let me, do me try and reshare it. I'll stop and reshare. Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised that that uh, people were just not saying anything. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can, I can see it. Yeah. Um, that looks okay. That's weird. So, so anyway, um, if we add the log filter, um, and this is just purely because I've got a, I'm just working on a bug at the world, not a bug, a feature at the moment. And then I've got the installed copy, which is slightly older. Um, so we go back to filter list, um, 
You can see I've got logs enabled. This will now start to do a level of log parsing. This feature is a gold mine. And I think, to be honest with you, we need to build it out a bit more. But this one can now start to um, figure stuff that's that's causing issues in the log. There's nothing really in my log, so that's great. But And you can see also I've got then a, a selection of providers. So I can actually go auth list. And I can list which, and you can have multiple providers enabled at once. So the cool thing about this is if we go back to like the, um, the explain, um, you know, we can then uh, output to JSON and we, you can then have multiple providers outputting at once. You might have noticed how quickly that happened is because it's also got built-in caching, supports S3, supports um, Azure caching, supports GCS. So really trying to make this as fungible as possible um, and work for people who want it in their local CLI, for people who want it in their CI CD pipeline, and for people who want it um, as a standalone operator in the cluster. I don't have the operator. Uh, let's see if I can do. Uh, so I might have installed Helm Store. I might have. A, I might have. A, I might have a bash command. I can pop it in. With, no, I don't have it in my on my uh, my computer. I don't have the operator installed. But the operator installs just you know in cluster and does more or less the same thing, except it gives you the the resource type. So uh, question: you, Oh, here you see OpenAI. So if you have another provider, you you will show. The yeah, yeah. So it's yeah the provider. The provider um, is they're, they're sorted by provider, right? So actually, that's kind of the feature I'm doing right now is um, uh, related to uh, related to basically giving you a way to detect um, which provider is being used. Um, so you can see if we go to sorry actually uh, so so in fact when we go to um here this is uh, this is the actual this is the secret source command right ai client pass um you 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 actually can set your provider dynamically and we can have multiple providers running passes at once you can do all sorts of interesting magic there and 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 this was just a request to enable prometheus to actually detect with the provider name so you have a label uh, that, that matches to that name uh, does that clarify your the question yeah, yeah, you know, so. okay, okay. But you have a sometimes you may have issues with uh, these providers actually not uh, answering uh, because you have uh, network connectivity or something, whatnot. Um, so you also have a mechanism for that, or, or that's not there yet. So, uh, well, when you're talking to OpenAI, for example, yeah, you might have like a timeout or, or yeah, so you down. <laughs> So it uses the um, it uses a pretty uh, popular library. I can't claim to have written. In fact, there's there's a couple of parts to this. Um, the, there's a KHGPT. Uh, there's a KHGPT. I think I'm just going to how this works now. There's a KHGPT intermediary library that we use, and that library calls a pretty popular GoLang based project that uses a RESTful HTTP client with the library as a default timeout. In that, I think it's thirty seconds. We set it to. Um, KHGPT itself, when it communicates to the operator and the backend. Um, so the deployment and the operator uses all gRPC based comms. Um, and I would say that um, people are getting really a lot more serious about using stuff like Olama. Um, you know, if you, if you folks are familiar with Olama, um, you download local models and you can serve it locally. Um, and, and you can connect KHGPT to this as, as long as it's um, compatible with the RESTful client, which this one is, uh, for, uh, as I said, this, this particular library we're using, which the name escapes me right now. So anyway, that, that's kind of that piece. I'll just go back to the slides and I'll wrap up. Just Alex, Alex uh, can you go back to the, the JSON output for a second uh, when sure. you got the, the results? Yeah. Uh, so just out of curiosity, the, uh, the, the kind of one through four there in the details, is that's essentially the response you're getting back from OpenAI at that point? You're just feeding the, the error message and then getting some... So we don't feed this error directly to OpenAI. There's a um, there's a whole prompt payload uh, piece inside of um, in inside of uh, KHGPT where we actually can uh, build out those prompts. But effectively, um, that is the response, though. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, just trying to understand kind of what's in the code and then what's in the, in the AI section and kind of where where that split is. Yeah, let's let's just sort of have take a little look at the code quickly, um, just to kind of give you again a bit more context. Uh, I'm just going to switch over to to VS Code very quickly. So if you um, take a quick look at something like this, we go to KHGPT. Um, I'll just grab that right now. It is here. Okay, 
Um, so there is quite a lot of code in this project. It's not like it's 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 the, yeah we're talking sort of quite close to hundred thousand lines. Um, the anal these are all the analyzers, right? And let's pick on like Gateway API, which has just recently been introduced. There's a lot of actual stuff that happens um, rather than just calling uh, calling any kind of AI. Like so, as I said, we're heavily predicated on the fact that we're using the client API, but because things like Gateway API aren't even in the standard constructs, we're having to use things like dynamic clients in places. Um, but in this particular scenario, this is looking for, you know, uh, a gateway class that hasn't been implemented on the basis of a gateway existing, this kind of stuff. Now, when you get that, it does package it up into a failure type. So in this particular failure, you can see the failure is a text string. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the failure also has an associated um, associated object kind. And then we later on down the line use these to, to create the uh, AI payload prompt based on the kind. You'll also see that we support sensitivity. So I'm not sure if you've uh, had a perusal of the, um, the actual capabilities, but one of the things that's supported is anonymization because that was really important to me early on was the ability to actually send data um, and feel confident uh, that there's a level of anonymization. In fact, it doesn't it doesn't work for pods because there's nothing to really to anonymize. We we made some decisions that anonymization sh should should not fusicate the pod name, but it fusicates other p bits and pieces. I'm happy to talk speak to that more later on. Did you have a question? Okay, if not, I'll I'll keep going and wrap and wrap in a moment. So just uh, to go back to the little question, uh, yeah, uh, with the anonymization, you. Um... Did you actually uh, maybe are looking at removing like some keywords or or because uh, yeah so so for example somebody might be running like a encryption pod or something like that you you mentioned that you're not anonymizing the no we we the, just to be clear really, no yeah. really clear yeah so so actually pods I think pods does does a few circuit names things like that I'm just looking as well scaling targets and other bits are a few scaled. It's like tokenization. This is not a security mechanism per se. It is more for just simple um, obfuscation to stop at a glance, um, you know, anybody who was on the receiving end of OpenAI knowing exactly that it was my secret bank doing X, Y, Z. I would never feel confident in actually saying this is any kind of security measure, but it has the it has the ability to be built out like that. For example, as you can see, it's like it's the names of things that are effectively being obfuscated. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, and we do yeah, our best I, as well you know, with I, prompts. I can just see that some some things might come up later with the uh, with some of these things, the names. Yeah, but you know, yeah. to be and to be honest, this isn't a panacea. You know, I, I was thinking of this last April before it's you know the general public had really even caught on to this being a problem, and so I'm quite happy to take advice on it because I'm not an expert. You know, I I did my we and we did our best as a team to kind of think about well, how can we make this a bit safer? In fact. I think you might remember, I was super against building a log analyzer. And even to this day, as you might have saw when I did the filter command, it's opt-in. You have to opt-in to use the log analyzer because I don't want to ship it by default. Because logs, as you know, scanning them has a little bit of a higher risk if you're sending log stuff out. Now, what I will tell you is, um, sorry, I switched back there. What I will tell you is that the logs, it never actually sends the logs itself ever. All it's doing is checking to look for uh, failure patterns in the logs. And if it has one, it says, ah, you've got a failure pattern in that log. So yeah, yeah. AI is, is, is it's a minefield right now with what you can send uh, remotely, which is also why uh, local um, local AI has become so popular. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, as long as uh, everything is documented and the end user can understand like the implications of using that or... Okay. Yeah, we we context and um, okay. So you, if you enable logs, you know you might have sensitive information there, and so you know you're warned. <laughs> yeah, we have pretty awesome uh, docs. I have to say, I was really happy to get a load of people to to help build these out. Um, can you see them on my screen? Yep. Yeah, like I'm yep. really proud of them, and I know I know a lot of docs can go along, but like these are. I really love the template. It's so nice to use. And I, I, yeah, a lot of people have helped. And I actually, I built a privacy policy, like a, a, a guidelines for privacy quite early on on what we do and don't collect. Um, we do not collect the logs, although I probably need to specify that you can monitor the logs, but we don't collect them. So you're absolutely right. Like we, are, it's not a completely solved problem. And I'm, I, we're just sort of trying to straddle this domain without really fully understanding it yet and the implications. So just let me, um, so I'm conscious of your time. I just, I'll wrap up by saying, um, this is where it's going. 
this is what people are doing already today. They are actually um, using local models, as I described earlier on, and they are actually um, connecting them through local AI to KGPT or, or using Olama. Um, what, what I don't describe here is that there are some experiments where folks are also using Kubeflow and um, I can't remember the name of the component uh, that allows you to do hyperparameter tuning. I think it might be called Kebit. I can't quite remember. Um, and they're using Kubeflow to do dynamic hyperparameter tuning on existing models to then refactor. And the way they're doing this is actually by adding a shim on top of KHGPT. So, oh, I've got a slide. I didn't realize. There we go. Kebit. That was it. Um, so there's some interesting stuff. I'm not too plugged into this yet because I've got a lot of other stuff on my plate. But this is super interesting because you're getting quite close to the ability to actually um, tell the model whether or not it was right or wrong and put it back into a training mode. Um, I think there's some caveats around this about how effective and expensive it would be to do, but it's interesting nonetheless to see that this is being attempted. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to wrap up by saying, um, I'm trying to donate this. This isn't my job. Like I have plenty of other work to do. Uh, I, I have, there's a good community of people and I feel like this is one of the few, few projects in the CNCF that doesn't have some vendor trying to make money out of it. So I'm quite happy to um, get any support you would wish to give on these on the, on the TOC public issue and just give a thumbs up because this would be really valuable for us to keep this in the community space. And lastly, as you've already been covering, uh, come join the fun and working group artificial intelligence. Um, I, I have seen you already discussed it, so I, I don't need to say any more about it. So I hope you found that interesting and I'm happy to field questions. Oh, I'm SRE from like more than two decades since I think that's that's awesome too. And especially the walk analyzing part, maybe this is gonna boost and uh, uh, Eric Sam is a training and consulting company that we're like more than 10 years in the market. Uh, and actually uh, we're gonna see if the tool is getting in the right direction, maybe we're gonna uh, add it to our curriculums. Because we're a non-biased company and uh, we don't sell and resell anything, but we are very deeply involved in the CNCF. We're actually a silver sponsor in CNCF. And uh, when we see uh, very good tools, we just put them in the curriculum and uh, just engage people to start using it. And I'd encourage you a lot of put So as we said, I'd encourage you to try it out, see if it fits, if you like it, if you don't change it you know like i've got no i've got nothing to gain by having um or, or to lose by having more people coming in and and and, and helping yeah. to us to shape the future of it so please i'd invite you to check it out yeah definitely we're gonna check it out and uh, as i said uh, we discussed that with linux foundation uh, in chicago and uh, we found out that uh, we have a lot of stuff that coming up with ai yeah so Glad to see it. Awesome. You might also be interested. I've just linked in the chat. I've got a Rust-based implementation, which is specifically for AWS. So that's another conversation there. That's not going into the CNCF yet. Yeah. Rogers. Awesome. Hey, Alex. Uh, thanks for the great pres presentation. Um, so you touched base upon uh, what some of the experiments that people are doing in terms of uh, taking in feedback from the analyzers and uh, what the model explains and then trying to uh, do dynamic hyper parameter tuning and things like that. You also mentioned that the KSGP doesn't collect logs, but are you thinking of a plausible scenario where someone who's deploying KSGP may want to uh, enhance the model that they're running on, like have you know some sort of fine tuning happening uh, and for this to happen, they may want to build a data set of their own. So does kids, so are you thinking along the lines of like, given the capability to build your data set and then uh, filter it out based on whatever are the false positives detected by the model and then fine tuning it again? Like, are you thinking along those lines? I am. Um... I have a bias towards the Unix philosophy. I don't think every tool has to do everything, right? I don't think KCPT needs to be this panacea of training and lot. You know, I think it does a, a pretty discreet set of things well. It's effectively and it's an it's a it's a supplementary tool for SREs. You know, that's how I describe it. And it uses a, it just happens to use AI. Do we want to then enable it to do the production of data sets and training? Maybe. But what I could do, what we could offer that we don't currently do, is we have a um, we have a pretty robust and I'll just show you since that's, that's let's do a demo. It's it's a great day for demos, right? You see my screen here, right? Um, 
if I go KGP serve, right, it's got a pretty good gRPC API built into it. What we could do is enable through that gRPC API the ability to do a bit more stuff. So you see there, I got, did that come out? Yeah. So we could do a bit more stuff like that. Um, by actually enabling folks to integrate with it some way like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm a bit cautious about it, to be honest with you. All right, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, okay. Question, sorry. Uh, hi, uh, good talk and uh, I'm Kai Shen from NScale. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, this is my first time to see the KAS. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if I have the uh, a, a GPT model endpoints, uh, is it uh, compatible with the OpenAI API? Uh, how do I integrate with the KAS GPT? Do I just need to uh, update the URL and uh, update the token or what, what do I need to do? Because uh, I just see the uh, the local AI provi provider, it has the limitation of the model it supports. So I'm not sure how, if I have the endpoint that I, I serve in my, uh, maybe EKS cluster, uh, and it is compatible with the OpenAI API. Uh, how do I support it? You see, it's in the, uh, in the KS GPT. Thanks. Yeah, if it's if it's um OpenAI compatible, it's providing the URL, um, and the token, and then as you say, if you want a different model, I have to check the parameters on the back end for local AI. You should be able to set the model, um. If not, open cut cut an issue, cut a ticket, and I will I'll I can show you how to do it. Um, I'm just checking right now because local AI actually, as you're, you're right, it, it it's just a um it's just an extension on the open a uh, it's just an extension on the open AI implementation. So it's almost this, exactly the same thing. Um, what we could do, if I recall correctly, is and I'm just looking through here at the moment, is we can set we can allow you to set the model. Um, through an environmental variable, but I don't think it exists in the command line. Basically, I, I'm happy to help you sort that. That's not a big deal. I uh, got it. Yeah, because I see, uh, I see that the doc says that it's used the Llama C++ to run it. So uh, the KS GPT will run, will serve, uh, serve a model for the users. Uh, is that correct or? So, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Oh. Uh, because I see a lot doc in the, the readme of the repository says that uh it will use the local AI will use the llama C plus plus uh to serve the model. That's right. Uh, so is this a user need to run the llama C plus plus to serve the model, or the KS GPT will help a user to do that? Oh, uh, okay, that's a really good question. And let me just also clarify your previous answer. I I I. I've got to confess, I'm split between about five projects at the moment. So I was just trying to remember. In the configuration, you can set the model on even local AI. So I can, I'm happy to show you how to, sorry, on uh, open it. So even on the open AI implementation, you can set the model. So we can do that. So when you then do the, the fetch or the pass, we can, that's not a problem. So happy to take that offline. I'll show you the command you need to run okay. with to, to the model. In fact, in the CLI, there is a bit of ability to add dash dash model, I believe, on the analyze, but I'll just check that in a moment. Uh, with regards to the second part of your question, KCBT itself doesn't do any fault sort of serving, right? The best way to do it, the thing about the simplest way is almost like running two Docker containers, right? You, you have one that has the inference API being served from Llama or from uh, from Llama C++, and then you have just KCBT connecting to that over localhost, like localhost 8080 slash completions, you know, V1 completions, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, okay. It'll be a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes part too, right? So if you're running a Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've got a ton of examples. Um, I'll actually uh, link you. There was a really good um, tutorial that somebody made around uh, local AI, and I can get you a link for that so you can play it. In fact, there are a bunch of tutorials, and I'll link it into the, um, the chat here, just anecdotally, uh, from our docs, where people have built out integrations. Now, the only project I'm supporting is HTTPT, so mileage may vary on these other projects, but uh, we're happy to support you if there's something broken. But as far as I know, a lot of these are pretty successful. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. Steve, any other question? Uh, hey, hey, Alex, thanks for the thanks for the demo. Um, just just uh, wondering about the the analyzers uh, briefly, if I understand correctly. Um, it looks like, uh, and you had said you're kind of codifying the SRE knowledge in a lot of the S in the in the analyzers, and then 
basically forming the prompts from that um, from the code there in in the the right format. Um, so that that's cool. And then is it also true then you're generally doing that for events and then generally doing that as an add-on for the logs as well? Yes. Yeah, so um, let's let's answer by walking through the code. It's always the best way to do it. So. Um, if you look at this analyzer for something like a pod, um, what you can see is we get pods, we list them out, we look to see if the phase is pending. If that one's pending, then we check to see if it's scheduled or if the status is unschedulable. If so, then that's a simple error, right? Otherwise, we go through container statuses, which we can then check to see if they're waiting, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there, are, is a, there is an, there is a um, scenario where the pod might be stuck in container creating. Now, this is typically uh, something like PVC unbound, right? So we then get the event and we combine that event um, with with the pod status to form the prompt to say this pod has this it has this is the event and then in the event status we can see what's going on in that pod and that's what we'll then send. So I would invite you to sort of just take a look through the code. Also in some of the unit tests, it makes us a bit clearer as well uh, in some of the ways that we're actually looking at. Like these these are effectively the conditions we're providing and these are the status messages that we're checking. So does that help to clarify it a little bit? I think so. Yeah. Um, it's it sounds like a basically a, a, a combination or you you have some some knowledge there on how to form the prompts properly based on your you know the current state of the API and your knowledge of 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 what what makes sense it's basically knowing where to look right so for example a pod um failing to create you you if you check to see the events and you can see and then you check to see like there's a PVC that's unbound you can we can form that prompt we can form that um that string without needing to just copy paste from Kubernetes. We can say something like, you know, this PVC, da, 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 insert name was unbound. We do that in some places, right? We'll format the string and we just send that to the AI. And sometimes the AI comes back and says, depending on which one you use, this is how you can triage this. So there is no magic here, but the, the, the thing I want to get to is that for the fidelity and the, and the um, usefulness of the AI responses is, com is completely predicated onto what we feed into it, right? So mm. we're quite happy to take contributions. So people say, oh, your pod analyzer is missing this, or your HPA right. analyzer actually has a gap there. We've got some examples of service analyzers, and they're pretty simple. Like it just takes to say, does the service exist? Do the labels in that service actually map to something that's existing, right? Does that service actually connect to a deployment? If not, then it's, it's a dangling service. So we'll, we welcome contributions in that sense. Sure. Do you, do you do it uh, generally outside of your your like drilling down into the pod and the status and the event? Do you have just like is the event is there an event option that's just just like here's an event forward that directly? Uh, and similarly in in the logs case, you're just kind of sending uh, specific things from the logs, right? Not not through a, a coded kind of drill down path. Yeah. So I guess the way of if I think of it that way, is, is that, are we looking at the events and then finding the, the the issues through the events, or are you saying are we doing it through the pods and then find the connected event to the pod? Kind of how are we how are we deducing that? Uh, yeah, just just trying to understand the the different paths that you would get to to send things to the the AI backend. Yeah, if so through the through, if it's all through the the coded kind of SRE knowledge, or is it just is there general cases as well? Like here's an event, send that along. We very rarely, um, we very rarely need to craft to handcraft like sort of snowflake messages to send over. There are some things that require that this mainly when you're when you need context between resources. Um, I keep coming back to the PVC or daemon sets, for example, where there's a, a node thing, a node health. We have to then do a get nodes, check nodes, any nodes set in there on ready state, et cetera. And then it needs a little bit of a more complex message, just purely because you're combining two strings together, right? You're you're saying, here's a message I got for this thing, here's a message I think I got for this thing try and simplify and concatenate these together. So I would advise you to take a look. Um, I'll find some, I'll find a few examples, like if that's interesting. I mean, the nice thing about open source is it's completely open um, and you can just check it out and have proofs through how it's implemented. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can see how this can become like something of hundreds of different combinations, right? Because I mean, the, the, the state of, how things uh, show up on a Kubernetes cluster can be, you know, you know, so many different combinations. Uh, you know, and that's interesting. That's, in that's interesting, yeah. right? Like, yeah, because it, the tenet that I use is that it's from the SRE perspective. Like, how have I found? How do I debug to find answers to things? So, 
all of that codified knowledge, all the code paths we've implemented are based off human human experience. And experientially, they all come out with a solution, right? So I know that when I see X, Y, Z, it's because of the dangling, this, this, this. But you're right, like there, there are permutations and, and and many things that we probably haven't, wouldn't catch unless we would experienced it ourselves and codified it. Yeah, so I think uh, in the future, it might be good to invest I mean, for the project in something that makes it easier for SREs or DevOps engineers to to actually not necessarily write it in code, but like, you know, show like a, some problem that they have or, or document some problem that they have, and that can actually be fed into the analyzer okay? so in, in, a, in a more like a, like a regular language type of way, right? But... I don't know, maybe or that's almost, not that easy. Not, not or that almost, easy. Um, yeah. So so OpenAI supports function loading, right? So you can you can stringify the functions and load them into OpenAI. So almost like here's KHGPT. These are all the analyzer functions it has. These are the capabilities they have. Tell me how I can best diagnose this issue that I'm having. And it calls the functions and then it builds up the picture. That is probably a couple of years out, but that's completely achievable. Yeah. Like a knowledge base type of thing, right? So yeah. Yeah, like the you you get you get basically then the AI to drive Kate's DBT to 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 drive to 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 derive the right answer. Yeah, yeah. Hey, any more questions? Uh, it's pretty exciting. I think it's going to be um, evolving pretty fast and. and We'll see. We'll see newer things, and and I think the community will get uh, interested. Yeah, please do help us get into Sandbox, and you can be whoever's interested. Chat to me if you would like to be a maintainer. If you want to get involved, if you want to use it in your company, happy to to work with you all. And we just want to see this benefit the community. Cool. Great talk, Alex. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Alex, for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.